Tell me if we win this war, will we know the flag we're fighting for? Will we know the cost and whose reward will we? Tell me what does winning mean? Will we have the world we always dreamed? Will we recognize the side of peace? Will we? And I know we're not the sins of our fathers, nor are we the broken hearts of our mothers. I know we can change the path, reclaim our last good chance to save our lives when we rise one two one two three four call in your angels the moment has come bury your pitchforks your torches and drums upon us my neighbors and friends tell a new story and bring to an end all of this madness and mass discontent who are the ones who are the ones who are sad we are the ones we've been waiting for and we can't stand to wait no more we are united with open arms and eyes. Together we will rise. Make way for you, they're already prepared. Courage and truth, they are already theirs. Answers within them will soon come to bear. All that they need is to be made aware. It's time to move. It's a time for rebirth It's time to prove what humanity's worth Those who will last must now be seated first For they're the ones who inherit the earth We are the ones we've been waiting for And we can't stand to wait no more we are united with open arms and eyes. Together we will rise. We will not ask for permission. We are the answer that's given. We are the ones who will return. We are the hope of the living. We are the ones we've been waiting for and we can't stand to wait no more we are united with open arms and eyes together we will rise we are the ones we've been waiting for and we can't stand to wait no more we are united with open arms and eyes Welcome, everybody. That was the uh, 2023. Yeah, jazz hands. There we go. You guys are doing great already. Um, the uh, Braver Angels 20, 2023 Songwriting Contest winner, Ben Karen. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing in the Q&A box that the chat isn't working for most folks. We're working on that. Um, but you can see uh, that even just from those who are finding it possible to chat, we have folks from all over the country and that is pretty much always the case. So um, we'll keep working on that chat setting and I'm gonna uh, go ahead and, and share more about uh, this great event that you're all here for. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. There it goes. Yes, Dayton, Ohio, Seattle, Lancaster, Wisconsin, 
California, Montana, Oklahoma. I love this. Um, it's just, we always have people from like literally everywhere. Uh, so for anybody who's new to Braver Angels, Braver Angels is a national nonprofit devoted to bringing Americans together to bridge the partisan divide. And if you have not been to a Braver Angels debate before, welcome. I think you'll have fun. And the these debates are a little bit different from what most people think of when they think of the word debate. Most people think of like um, maybe the kind of competitive debate that you do in high school where you're trying to like, you know, defeat the other side and say all the right statistics and that sort of thing. This is not quite like that. Um, we uh, And it's also not like political debate, which is the other thing people think of. Um, we define our debates by their spirit, which is a spirit of a collective search for truth. And so that means that among other things, the number one rule of our floor is that we ask that you say what you actually believe. And so that's reflected in questions and in what our five fabulous panelists have agreed to uh, to speak to tonight. Um, the uh, Another thing that's true about our debates is that, so this is a panel debate. We, we also do community debates. And in this style of debate, we have you know some pre-selected speakers, but anyone is welcome to ask a question. And so you might think that the way that you do that is by putting it in the Q&A box. That would be a reasonable thought. However, we're doing it a different way tonight. And that's so that we can make sure that we have a red and a blue um, filtering the questions to make sure that both sides are represented. And so in order to ask a question, you will want to uh, use a, a link um, to a Google form, which has just gone into the chat. So what I would recommend is that you click that link now and just keep that tab open because it's very simple. It's like your name, are you willing to ask the question and what's your question? Um, and so I would just have that link be open because then at any point during the debate, if you're like, huh, I wonder, it's right there and you can just go right into it. Um, I, uh, yeah, so don't use the Q&A box, use our link. And we'll put that in, into the chat periodically in case you lose it. So tonight we have five spectacular panelists and we were originally planning on having six. And so there's one small change, which is that um, sadly Hans von Spakovsky uh, let us know about 45 minutes ago that he has a family situation that means he can't attend tonight. We're sad because he's cool and fiery and has very interesting things to say, but um, we are still including his the materials that he sent in as a resource um, in the resources that we'll distribute at the end of this debate. And panelists, as you know, you can refer to his arguments in that paper or otherwise as you see fit. So for the, oh, and the, the adaptation we're making to that is to, to reflect that is that so that the affirmative and negative sides are still uh, equal, we are splitting his time in half and giving it to the other two negative speakers. So you'll notice a little bit of asymmetry in speaking times and that's to reflect this change. So we have five fabulous individuals who are still here and will be uh, educating us and inspiring us about ranked choice voting tonight. And, and so just gonna introduce them for you. So John Aldrich is the Pfizer and Edmund T. Pratt Jr. University Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Duke University. Aldrich is known for several books and articles on various topics, including political parties, partisanship, and electoral system, uh, systems. Barry Fagan is a professor of computer science and a senior fellow at the Independence Institute in Denver, Colorado. Fagan's columns have appeared in many newspapers. He is the author of scholarly papers on a wide variety of scientific and social topics, including ranked choice voting. Scott Kendall is a practicing attorney, former chief of staff to the governor of Alaska, and senior advisor at the Institute for Political Innovation. Kendall is known for his work drafting and defending a 2020 ballot measure in Alaska. The measure, approved by Alaskan voters, instituted an open primary system and ranked choice general elections. John Ketchum is a fellow and director of state and local policy at the Manhattan Institute. Ketchum has written about the need for electoral reform in New York City, where currently a version of ranked choice voting is used for local primary and special elections. And last but not least, Nathan Lockwood is executive director of Rank the Vote. Lockwood was highly involved in the movement for voter choice in Massachusetts. Now, in his role as executive director at Rank the Vote, he works with volunteers across the country to fight for ranked choice voting systems. Um, 
So rank choice voting, as you probably know, is a little bit technical as a topic. And so just to set everybody on a firm foundation as we dive into it, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna show a very simple video that explains it. It's just a, like one minute um, that can be a refresher for those of you who already know. And I found it really helpful just to clarify things. And then we're gonna offer um, a few definitions of terms that may come up during the debate. So uh, Natalie, if you would go ahead and, and show our one minute explainer video, that would be great. Pick your favorite color. The ranked choice voting way. Instead of voting for just one color, you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, I want blue. And if neither of those wins, I guess I can live with orange. Now, let's count up everybody's votes. Under ranked choice voting rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority more than 50% of the votes. Purple's ahead, but it has only seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate the color in last place. Sorry, Orange fans, we're going to your second choice. Two more for green. One for purple. But no color has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye bye, bye blue. blue. One more for purple. Four for green. And we have a winner, the Ranked Choice Voting Way. Nice. Thank you much. So there's that, which again, hopefully is fairly straightforward. Yeah, jazz hands, absolutely. Yes, um, I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, uh, but first, just to go through a few definitions and these will be in the chat so you can use them for reference um, throughout the debate as you wish. So Ranked Choice Voting is a voting system where voters use a rank to order candidates in a sequence from first, second, third, and onwards on their ballots. Generally, this is paired with an instant runoff algorithm that eliminates the lowest vote recipient and redistributes votes until one candidate wins with more than 50% of the vote. I feel like that video was like way clearer than what I just said, but that's your definition. Second, an open primary or nonpartisan primary is a primary in which any registered voter may vote in any party primary, regardless of their own party affiliation. It's a primary in which all qualified candidates are listed on the same, or, or sorry, a nonpartisan primary is a primary in which all qualified candidates are listed on the same ballot, and any registered voter can vote for any candidate with a pre-selected number of top vote recipients, recipients, two to five, moving on to the general election. Top five voting is an election method where the top five or whatever number of top vote recipients advance to the general election, usually from a nonpartisan primary. Proportional representation is an electoral system under which subgroups of an electorate are reflected proportionately in the elected body, producing mixed representation reflecting how votes are cast. And the, uh, the spoiler effect is the effect of vote splitting between candidates who often have similar ideologies, resulting in an opponent of both winning. So like I said, those will be in the chat um, and you can use them throughout the debate for reference. A couple of final notes um, for how you can participate tonight. Uh, so we know that there are hundreds of you out there and we're very happy to see you. And uh, because this is a, a webinar, we, um, you will not see yourself on the screen. However, we do want you to ask questions if you're if you're interested. Um, so the, the link is once again in the chat. Thank you, Leslie, for sticking that in there. And um, like I said, I recommend that you just have that up in a tab. And if you do want to ask a question, so we use a simplified version of parliamentary procedure. If you've been to a Braver Angels debate before, you're familiar with this. And there's really only one rule that we take pretty seriously, and it's called addressing the chair. So as it says in my little Zoom handle, my name is Madam Chair for the rest of the evening. And anytime you're talking, you're going to talk as though you're talking to me. Uh, and I just, I just get that privilege. So um, what that sounds like is if uh, John had just given a speech and Barry was going to ask him a question, rather than saying, John, you said this, Barry would say, Madam Chair, the prior speaker said da 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 da, or Professor Aldrich or whatever said blah, blah, blah. Um, my question for him is X. So you just have to put it in the third person. And so if you are selected for a question, 
um, what will happen is we will bring you into the room and unmute you and then invite you to ask your question that way. So Madam Chair, the prior speaker said X, my question is Y. And then the last thing, which you've already seen, is jazz hands. So these are jazz hands. We also accept spirit fingers and um, they are our way of showing approval. Uh, and so I will invite you to uh, offer jazz hands to, to your fellow panelists, panelists throughout the night. And um, folks at home, I actually recommend using them too, even though like if you're watching with someone, I guess somebody will see you. I actually like do these at my screen sometimes. Um, it's a problem. I, I used to uh, <laughs> do them at dinner with my ex and he'd be like, what, what are you doing? You're we're right here. But um, anyway, so what that's for is just anytime that you like a thing that someone said or something's funny, or you're like, yeah, I really agree with that. Or you just want to show some respect, give the speaker some jazz hands. That's how we do that. So without further ado, um, I'd like to call on our first affirmative speaker. Uh, yes, jazz hands already. Exactly. Um, Nathan Lockwood. Nathan, you have five minutes. Go ahead and unmute. Go for it. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so my name is Nathan Lockwood, Executive Director of Rank to Vote. So yeah, the, the reason why uh, Rank to Vote was founded and uh, what reason why we're working on ranked choice voting is, is that politics feel very broken right now for most Americans. Uh, part of that is that the stuff that everyday people uh, need the government to facilitate or get done is not getting done reliably, and that takes a toll on people's lives um, and their ability to fully enjoy their lives. Uh, and I think the other thing, and that I think folks in Braver Angels would recognize, is that there's a really high level of political polarization and you know negativity and discourse that feels like way beyond what what one would want or expect. And it turns out that um, you know. Uh, it turns out that a lot of this can be attributed to the way we vote. Uh, amongst advanced democracies, uh, America's voting system is really amongst the worst in the world. We use a system of voting that is called uh, plurality voting, sometimes called first past the post, uh, mostly in single member districts. And um, we're really one of four advanced democracies that are still using this, um, unless Great Britain, Canada, and um, and India, uh, the rest of the world has moved on to use more advanced voting uh, systems, most of them incorporating elements of what's referred to as proportional representation, and a couple of them uh, using ranked choice voting. Uh, so why did we choose, amongst the, the better voting systems out there, why is ranked vote working on ranked choice voting? Well, you know, we see ranked choice voting is a good you know, America's been using voting the same way for the last 200 years. You know, it was a voting system that was set up with, you know, very good intentions uh, to, to create a democratic uh, system. Um, but uh, we're to, to get somewhere different, you know, it's, change is hard. And most people don't even realize that there are other different ways to vote. They haven't thought about it. And it's, it's eye-opening them. So a lot of the work that we do at Ranked Vote is education. Uh, just just going up to people and say, hey, have you heard about ranked choice voting? And most people still haven't. Um, when they do learn about it, uh, understand what you learned from that video and a little bit of why. You know, now you don't just pick one candidate. You can rank them in the order you like them. If your favorite doesn't win, your vote isn't thrown out. It still counts for your next choice. So you can always vote for your favorite without worrying about wasting your vote. Um, we chose this because it's really one simple change, one simple upgrade to, Amer to, to our voting system. It, it, you know, well, it does take education and, uh, you know, about to people about the benefits of the system. It takes organizing to, you know, educate public officials about it to get it implemented. Um, Fifty cities around the country are now using it. Two states, Maine and Alaska. Jazz hands for Scott and the folks up in Alaska making that happen. So it's been demonstrated as a change that Americans are capable of making. And the places that have made the change overwhelmingly are satisfied, much more satisfied with the new system. So that's that's why we chose ranked choice voting. It has a lot of benefits. Um, and the big benefit of ranked choice voting really is the, the problem with our pick one system, it works fine when there are only two candidates running, but what in our life do we have only two choices of? I'm, you know, kind of a Gen X person. I grew up in the 80s during the Cold War. You know, we were explained and it didn't take a lot of explanation why one party states are bad. <laughs> Not a lot of choice there. Uh, two choices is better than just one choice, but it's still not a lot. And when you can only pick one, the fact that our voting system breaks down as soon as you have add an additional choice, because when you add that third candidate, they may hurt 
one of the other two more than the others. A great example is Florida in 2000, Ralph Nader, Al Gore, uh, George W. Bush. Obviously, the main contest is between Bush and Gore here. A whole election comes down to Florida, and uh, George W. Bush wins this election with five, by 500 votes. You couldn't make it any closer. 500 votes and not a majority, like 49% or something. Meanwhile, Ralph Nader gets 100,000 votes. Um, Democrats were freaking out about Nader running from the beginning because they, they, they sensed that if he ran, he would penalize Al Gore. He would take votes that would otherwise go. And exit polls suggest that they were correct, that about 45% of Nader voters would have voted for Gore, 25 for Bush, 25% would have voted net-net. Al Gore would have picked up roughly 18,000 votes and, and won, won Florida, won the presidency, uh, and done so with a majority support instead of like Bush did without a majority support. This is a nonpartisan issue. It cuts both ways. If you dial back to 1992, uh, George H.W. Bush, his campaign folks felt Ross Perot's participation kept him from winning and allowed Bill Clinton to win with just 43%. So the beautiful thing about ranked choice voting is it fixes that flaw in our current system. You can now have more than two choices. And with ranked choice voting, you know, you could, if you're a Nader voter, you could rank Nader first and Gore second. If you're a Perot voter, conservative Perot voter, you could vote Perot first and Bush second. So um, it opens up our system to uh, a wider range of debate, more legitimate candidates, potentially more legitimate parties. Uh, and there's some other benefits as well, but basically it breaks out of that limited choice paradigm. And that's really, so the fact that it's an easy adaptation to our current system and starts to open that system up we feel makes it a natural kind of next step reform for America. Uh, Madam Chair, you're on mute. Pardon me, I was muted, even me. Yes, so sorry. Um, let's give some jazz hands to our, our excellent first speaker. Thank you so much, Mr. Lockwood. Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, remind everybody how you ask a question, and then we're going to have a couple. So the way that you ask a question in our form of debate is there are a couple pieces of it. The first is that you um, uh, you need to use our form. So you submit questions through the form. And the link has gone into the chat a couple times. It looks like it's just gone in there again. Uh, and just so you know, those are being looked at by a red screener and a blue screener, and then um, moved up to uh, be asked. And when you're selected to ask a question, I will bring you into the panel for a second, unmute you and invite you to ask your question, which you will ask in the form of Madam Chair, the prior speaker said XYZ, my question for them is ABC. Panelists, you are also welcome to ask questions. So without further ado, um, are there questions for Mr. Lockwood? I see one from Mr. Waugh. Give me a second just to bring you into the room. Also, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. W-A-U-G-H. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Um, so go ahead and unmute yourself, Ms. Jack Wall. Uh, I have permitted you to talk and yeah, go ahead and ask your question. We're not hearing you yet. Um, maybe try one more time and let's see. All right, then let's hop over for a minute to Hank Fay. I know you have a question as well. And Jack, maybe try muting and unmuting again and we'll, we'll see if that works. Um, Hank, go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Um... Our country has become increasingly divided over the last 45 years. Prolonged division leads to autocracy. What data is there that shows the effect of RCV on political division? Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Lockwood. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Hank. Uh, yeah, so there's <laughs> ranked choice voting is now in the 21st century has been used it's currently used in 50 cities. Uh, some of those cities have been using it for over a decade now, uh, long enough that there's been research done uh, on the cities where ranked choice voting is being used. 
And it turns out that ranked choice voting has some positive dynamics that decrease negative campaigning, um, meaning uh, there are incentives for candidates uh, to uh, talk more about their own virtues and positive stuff and less incentive for them to kind of th do mudslinging and bash their opponents. The reason for this is ranked choice voting, voters rank their ballots. The way we count the ballots is, is you saw in the sticky note video, it to win, you need to get a majority of support from the voters. And if you're running in that election, that means that in addition to getting your, your um, biggest supporters to vote for you, you may also, you will likely need your opponent's supporters to rank you second or third, in other words, to like you. And so the example, uh, the, the anecdote that I, I love from um, jurisdictions that have ranked choice voting, where there have been campaigns for candidates under ranked choice voting elections, people who have, you know, I don't, you know maybe folks on the phone have door knocked for candidates or participated in campaigns. And in our current campaigns, if you're, uh, if you're door knocking for your favorite candidate and you're walking down the street and you see uh, a yard sign in a house that's for the opponent, you're just going to keep walking on by. You know that person's made up their mind. There's no reason to talk to them. Uh, under ranked choice voting, you're going to go door knock that, that door anyways. And you're going to say, you know, hi, I see you're, you're voting for April. Um, I'm voting. Uh, I, I'm here supporting with Leslie. And I'd like you to tell you the five things that April and Leslie agree on and ask you to choose Leslie as your second or third choice. So this is emphasizing uh, areas of common ground and agreement as opposed to just only talking about the areas of disagreement. And I think, you know, anyone who's watched contemporary American debates can see that that's uh, quite different than what we're used to, where candidates seem to want to if, you know, agree is something they, if the other candidate starts agreeing with them, they start disagreeing with a position they maybe liked uh, before the other person started agreeing with them. So uh, that's, the, and there's been studies of this. The studies have been primarily around measuring uh, voter perceptions of negativity in cities that use RCV and cities that don't, or measuring it before they started and afterwards. And there's been significant measures of decreased negativity, decreased perceptions of negative campaigning. Right. And Jack Waugh, we'll come back to you, or Wog. Um, I'm probably just butchering your name. You can't do anything about it. <laughs> Try unmuting one more time, and let's see if it works. All right. It now looks like you're unmuted, but I still can't hear you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and ask your question, since I do have a copy of it. Uh, so Jack's question um, is, to those in the affirmative, so uh, Mr. Lockwood, um, please explain why it's good to reject rated voting, e.g. score or star. So Mr. Lockwood, if you could maybe explain what that is and then why you don't, uh, why that's not your, your uh, method of choice, that would be great. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is, you know, there are some things in common between that you could say are similar between ranked choice voting and score or star. And the similarity is that these methods, you know, uh, all provide the voters with a more expressive ballot. They allow them to say, express some sen some preference or sentiment about multiple candidates. And, uh, in, you know, with ranked choice voting, they're putting them in order. The other ones are kind of giving them a score. Um, the reason why I would say most ranked choice advocate voting advocates are focused on that, it is a, you know, it's been a, a well-proven system. It's been used in for national, the most important national elections in Australia and Ireland for over a hundred years. So it's very much proven. At a theoretical level, there's some some reasons to suggest why it has been durable and why it has been uh, chosen by, you know, for public elect, you know, for public elections uh, in, you know, many jurisdictions across the world. Um, and the, the biggest one is, uh, uh, there's a principle called later no harm, where under ranked choice voting, you never hurt your first choice by ranking additional candidates. Your lower rankings never hurt the higher rankings because the way the votes are counted, you remember with the sticky notes, if the blue, if you're, if you put blue on top of your sticky note pile and blue is still in the running, it's not eliminated. We never even look underneath your pile to see <laughs> who else you chose. But with um, a score and range systems, um, it is possible for a voter to sort of be hurting their their highest scored choice 
because at the same time, someone they scored lower, that score is still contributing and could help that lower scored person uh, beat their 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 higher choice, if that makes sense. Um, and that the fact that in some other things can give rise to potentially different strategic voting with those other systems that could somewhat destabilize the system and discourage honest voting, both by voters who don't want to hurt their top choice. And it also has they also have properties that could allow opponents to essentially vote for their favorite, but also sort of play in their opponent's side of the race by sort of elevating other candidates that are weaker to their opponent, similar. So, so I would say, long story short, both from a theoretical standpoint and the uh, long track record of ranked choice voting, it's something we feel we can confidently recommend to public officials for uh, for our, our most important elections. All righty, very good. Uh, one more round of jazz hands for our speaker and our questioners. Thank you so much. And um, with that, the speaker is thanked. And we will now move to a speech in the negative um, uh, from Mr. John Ketchum. You have seven and a half minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my gratitude to Braver Angels for giving me this opportunity to reason together in a pursuit of truth alongside such thoughtful panelists and attendees. Local elections for offices like city council may not draw the most buzz, but they affect the daily lives of most Americans more than what happens in Washington. We shouldn't lose sight of the need to reinvigorate local democracy through higher turnout and robust political competition. I'm speaking to you from New York City, where we're not shy about our opinions. Yet like other large American cities, the vast majority of our registered voters don't bother to turn out for local elections, even after we adopted ranked choice voting. And that's in part because we still effectively have only one political party to choose from. Madam Chair, I'm not here to say that RCV is always and everywhere a bad system. Every voting system has trade-offs and a one size fits all approach isn't how American federalism should work. Voters in some places and for some elections might find that the benefits of RCV outweigh its downsides. Voters elsewhere might choose other systems, and that's fine too. But I'm a reformer at heart, and I am here to say that if we believe our electoral systems aren't serving the majority of Americans well, if we know that voters want fundamental change, then we reformers should focus our efforts on things other than ranked choice voting. And here's why. RCV is merely one part of a much wider and more complex electoral infrastructure. Adopting it won't automatically change single member districts or redistricting, the primary system, ballot access and voter registration laws, whether party labels appear on ballots, the timing of state and local elections, the ways Americans receive their news, or the number of members in a legislative body. RCV alone cannot make up for the effects of these factors when they insulate those in power from meaningful political competition. In New York City, we adopted RCV in 2019 for primary and special elections for local offices like mayor and city council. But we still kept single member council districts, fully closed primaries and odd year elections, which means that almost every local race is decided after a low turnout democratic primary that just now uses RCV. In 2021, our high profile election without an incumbent saw only 26.5% of eligible New Yorkers vote in the ranked choice primary. This June's city council primaries had far worse turnout, often in the single digits. And one party still controls nearly 90% of city council seats and all the major citywide offices. New York is certainly not alone in this regard. Standing alone, therefore, RCV is at best a modest procedural change with modest results. Lee Drutman and Maressa Strano of New America, for example, reviewed the literature about RCV and found a pattern of null to small effects, indicating that it falls short of its tall promises. At the same time, it generates lots of political opposition, including sustained repeal efforts, as my opponents no doubt know, drawing out the oxygen from other needed changes. We've seen this both in, in Maine and Alaska, as Mr. Kendall is quite familiar with. Now, history also teaches this lesson time and again. In New York City, from 1936 to 1947, 
Elections for city council use a system of multi-winner ranked choice voting called a single transferable vote that obtains proportional representation, matching the share of votes that each party received to the number of seats in the city council. Charged council debates entertained and excited New Yorkers in the press and over the airwaves. At least four parties uh, were represented in the council during this period of PR. Uh, and New York wasn't alone in this experiment. As the political scientist Jack Santucci has written exceptionally, about two dozen American cities adopted STV in the 20th century. And STV is considered the gold standard among uh, RCV reformers. But with the sole exception of Cambridge, Massachusetts today, every one of those jurisdictions has since abandoned their reforms. Why? Well, it turns out that people don't like when votes go from one side of the political divide to another. Uh, when votes get transferred from a candidate of one party to a candidate of the same party or an aligned party, that's fine. You can think of the Green Party to the Democratic Party or the Libertarian Party to the Republican Party. But when votes move from one eliminated major party candidate to a candidate of the opposite major party or another opposition party, as what happened in Alaska in 2020 when Republican Nick Begich's vote went to his Democratic opponent, Mary Peltola, that unpredictability causes upset. And historically, that has meant that both parties coordinate together to undo this system of single transferable voting. Madam Chair, therefore, instead of fighting tooth and nail for RCV, reformers should focus on feasible alternatives with the greatest impact. And here are some ideas. Let's eliminate closed partisan primaries, which nine states use in the full form, fully closed primaries, to limit those who are able to participate in the nomination process by requiring that you be registered in, the, in a particular party in order to participate in that primary. Closed primaries make general elections all but foregone conclusions too often, and they encourage incumbents to take hardline positions for fear of losing to a primary challenger. While we're at it, Let's re-examine odd year local elections, which have far lower turnout than elections held on even numbered years when federal elections occur. Matching the federal election cycle could, with one simple change, likely dub out, double turnout in local races, or even better, especially during presidential election years. And finally, here's an innovation. Let's give voters rich information on ballots so that they can immediately align their values and preferences with those who are running. We can print endorsements on ballots, not only from political parties, large and small, but from elected officials like the mayor or governor, and from groups like the Chamber of Commerce, labor unions, newspapers, civic associations, and others. We can reinvigorate local participatory democracy by giving these groups a greater say in elections. In sum, Madam Chair, there's lots of upside for electoral reform to bring about a more representative and more effective democracy. We should not foreclose RCV entirely, but let's not pin our hopes on it. And let's make the most of the momentum to reform what will give Americans the political competition they so sorely need and deserve, especially at the local level. Thank you. All right, excellent. Jazz hands for our first negative speaker. Yes, bravo. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we will go to questions. And panelists, you can raise your regular hand and other folks. Sandy, um, Sandy Hubley, go ahead and um, it looks like you are unmuted and you can go ahead and ask your question. Madam Chair, um, Mr. Ketchum has said that he's not in favor of ranked choice, ranked choice voting because it doesn't make enough of a change. Um, I'm, I've only recently heard of a system in Australia where each person sort of votes twice. They vote once for the person they like, and then they put in a negative vote for the person they like least. And um, I agree with Mr. Ketchum that that would most be most effective if in open primary setting. But would he found, find that to be more acceptable than RCV? Uh, I'm not familiar with that particular form of voting in Australia. I do know that uh, Australian elections have used a form of the single transferable vote, um, uh, Ireland and Malta also. But if you look across the globe, most countries that use a proportional representation system, in fact, use what's called a party list system, which necessarily brings in parties to 
the electoral structure. So instead of uh, voting for um, you know candidates and candidates alone, let's say you can vote for an independent candidate as we're familiar with in the US, you'd have to be part of a party. Now there are different ways of um, creating party list systems. You can have a closed list system in which you know, the party committee, you might say the party machine uh, selects all of the nominees and then the voter simply votes for that slate of nominees by voting for the party. Um, or you can have an open list system whereby um, you can vote for a candidate and that vote also counts for the party. The party share of the vote gets allocated um, on a proportional basis and the, the candidates who get the most votes within that party uh, get their seats first. So that's how most countries tend to work this out. And I am um, much more of a fan of, of those kinds of systems. Um, they're much more tried and true. Uh, as Mr. Lockwood said, you know, there is a value in looking to other precedents, and this is quite well established in other Western democracies uh, across Europe. I believe it's uh, 21 out of 28 Western democracies to, do use a, a form of um, proportional representation. So um, that's the kind of change, especially at the local level, that I um, would be in favor of. And I think it would uh, yield much uh, more impactful results than single member district ranked choice voting as we have in New York City. Thank you. All right, very good. And for our next question, we will go, uh, Mr. Pagan, go ahead. I'm Thanks. Gonna... Um, first of all, um, everything uh, John just proposed, I'm in favor. I think it's great. Um, my specific question is, um, John, is it possible that maybe the reason- okay. Madam Chair. Uh, you have to ask I'm sorry, you. Madam you. Chair, the previous speaker uh, had uh, talked about low turnout in New York, New York City. I'm wondering if um, he thinks if it's uh, what he thinks about the possibility of the fact that turnout is so low is precisely because local government elections are a partisan and b held in a, a one party city. Thank you. Um. Madam Chair, I thank the speaker for his question. Uh, I think we do have a one-party si system, um, but people are discouraged by that. They, we, we know, for example, that there is an overwhelming enrollment advantage uh, to Democrats as compared to Republicans or independents. Um, but our closed primary system, in fact, contributes to that by uh, encouraging everyone to register as a Democrat in order to participate in the only election that really matters which is the Democratic primary. So if you are an unaffiliated voter, there are more than 1 million of them in New York City, uh, you can't participate in any primary. You are shut out entirely. And I think that's wrong. And it, it actually means that they don't have a meaningful say because the general election is a foregone conclusion. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that if you had uh, an on-cycle election, you would be moving the needle in, the, in a positive direction by broadening the, the base. But um, and, but I, I think ultimately our problem there is with the closed primary system. And I would tend to think that closed primaries are the bigger problem um, than, than the spoiler effect. I would trade single member RCV for uh, an open primary system in New York City. Interesting, great, thank you. For a final question, we'll go to Linda Paul. Go ahead and, oh, you're unmuted, excellent. Ask your question to me. We can't hear you yet. Okay, I'm gonna mute you. Try unmuting one more time. Okay. All right. yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to ask Speaker Lockwood um, how ranked choice will at the moment would can only ask questions, questions to the person who has spoken. Um, so uh, this, we'll... this question, I guess, really wouldn't work for I don't think that Mr. The, spe the speaker would address this issue, so I'm sorry. No, no, sorry, I should have clarified that. Um, but keep the question. It probably will apply to the next affirmative speaker, so thank you. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, those having been very good questions and good answers. One more round of jazz hands. Uh, the speaker's thanked. Okay, we will now move on to a speech in the affirmative uh, from Mr. Scott Kendall. Mr. Kendall, go ahead and unmute. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
a lot of good conversation here. Um, I fall somewhat in the middle. Um, I actually don't believe that RCV is a panacea. Um, I believe that RCV has actually failed in some areas. And the reasons it failed is I studied um, when I was designing what we call ballot measure two up here is that when there's too many choices, you give people 30 choices, they rank two or three, they give up because that's too much for a human brain to process, too much research. And um, in my research, what I found was human brain can sort four to seven objects. And that's how people think. Um, and so what we designed was a top four, pick one nonpartisan primary. The top four finishers from that primary election go on to the general. And they're really, um, considering your last cho choice will never count, people really just have three choices to make. Um, I will um, say, although I don't agree with John about um, whether ranked choice voting is valuable, um, I agree with John strongly that open primaries is the far, far, far more important reform. It's far more powerful. It's far more important to where we are as a nation. Um, the ranked choice voting in my mind, because originally when I started my work on election reform, I was going to do a top two primary. Uh, the problem we have here in Alaska, 63% of our voters are not affiliated with either major party. Our political life up here, and probably in many places, is far, far too diverse to be represented by top two primaries. Um, so the ranked choice voting just essentially, it exists to sort out the four candidates who are on your ballot so you don't end up electing, um, you know, basically a crazy person with 27%. Um, it it was passed up here in 2020. Uh, it was used uh, for the first time in 2022 for both the special election to replace Congressman Young and then in our regular elections. Um, every single winner out of 62 races, every single winner actually got a true majority which is to say um, sometimes in, in uh, ranked choice voting, there's exhausted ballots. And the hit on ranked choice voting is that, well, you exhaust enough ballots, you have a false majority. In fact, every single winner in every single race in Alaska had a true majority of all ballots cast. Um, another thing I would uh, touch on is it's not tricky, it's not weird. This isn't really for this panel. I think this panel understands how ranked choice voting works, but there's no algorithm. Um, there's nothing tricky about it. It's essentially a sorting process. And because I'm an elections attorney, I'm probably one of the few people who's actually seen the hand recount of a ranked choice election. And I'm happy to say it's super simple. There's literally, um, you know, you have several tables set up, but on each table, there's four stacks of ballots, one for each candidate. It's announced which vote, which one got the fewest. They take that stack and they resort it and reallocate it among the second choices. It's actually literally that simple. I watched them do it. And I've been uh, at recounts of regular elections. It took only marginally longer and it wasn't confusing to anyone there, even some of the candidate volunteers who are not fans of the system. Um, the turnout level in Alaska was the same as historic, so it didn't drive down turnout. Um, we did an exit poll of voters, 80%, even those who didn't like the system found it simple. Um, and actually, what was remarkable to me, which I never would have guessed, our spoiled votes were actually lower than normal. Out of our entire state, hundreds of thousands of voters, 341 spoiled votes. So people used the system. They found it easy to use. Um, and one of the remarkable outcomes, I believe, is um, our state Senate has 20 members. Um, the election results were such that we had nine Democrats and 11 Republicans elected. Um, in the regular world, in the lower 48, as we call the rest of you, um, that would mean you had an 11-person Republican majority. Um, three of those Republicans were very hard-right Republicans. And what happened was we have a 17-person, nine Democrats, eight Republicans, supermajority in our state Senate. Um, and the three Republicans who are ex very extreme um, were basically put in a... a super minority caucus where they don't even have committee memberships sort of pushed aside that resulted in a balanced budget and the largest one-year investment in education funding in the history of our state. Um, I guess I would, um, I'm trying to be quick because I think we're running a little long, but I, I guess I would say, I would end with essentially, um, you know, I, 
Uh, my own background is um, I'm an elections attorney. I do other work as well. I was Senator Murkowski's attorney in 2010 um, when she lost the Republican primary and ran as a write-in candidate and is the only person in the history of the country to actually run as a write-in and defeat candidates from both parties. The only other write-in to win a statewide election was Strom Thurmond, who was replacing a dead person. Senator Murkowski ran against both and actually won the election by 5%. Um, and I was there as we counted ballots. Um, I saw ballot after ballot after ballot from regions of our state where people don't even speak English, with Lisa Murkowski's name spelled perfectly. And the amount of effort to do that beyond the effort um, in normal voting um, sort of set me on this path where... Um, you know, long before this is the Tea Party era, not the not the Trump era, but hyperpartisanship is a disease, and it's a disease that's worsening. People are getting more polarized. Um, our belief here is that these free market elections that Alaska has come up with are the cure. And with that, I'll conclude. All right, jazz hands for our wonderful Alaskan speaker. All right, uh, questions. Let's try your question again. Uh, Ms. Linda Paul, if you're up for it, I think it applies here. Okay, I'll try again, Madam Speaker. Um, I would like to ask the speaker how ranked choice voting would affect or work with or against uh, the Electoral College in presidential elections. Thank you. Um, it would not impact the Electoral College, uh, except in the fact that you would not have the Nader effect, so to speak. Um, so imagining a world where Florida um, in 2000 repeats, the Nader votes would get reallocated. And presumably the person who wins Alaska's, you know, three tiny electoral votes, um, that person will have to win a majority of either first, second, third choice votes. That's the only difference. Very good. Uh, Mr. Ted Getchman. Go ahead. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I would like to ask the last speaker, given the desire to move away from plurality voting, why was plurality voting chosen for use in the Alaskan open primary? Um, it was chosen for the very same reason that the, the open primary, the top four primary was selected to begin with. Um, in the special election to replace Congressman Young, um, in the primary, there were 48 candidates. No human being on the face of this earth is going to choose amongst 48 candidates. The thought in the primary is very, very simple. Pick your favorite. Follow your heart. Pick your favorite. And with a large enough field being four, some have advocated for five, but with a large enough field, the viable candidates rise to the surface, as opposed to a situation where, um, you know, really where I have seen ranked choice voting fail is... Um, punishing voters by giving them a, a ballot in which they're asked to rank 10, 20, 30 candidates. In this case, it would have been 48 candidates. So it's really, it's a mechanical process to keep people engaged. Um, I always compare it to, I was trying to create a voting system that makes decisions the way I make decisions in my life, which is I'm going to buy a new car. I go to the car lot. I don't test drive 38 different cars. I say, hey, I want a pickup truck. I'm going to try the Toyota Tacoma, Nissan Frontier, Honda Ridgeline. I'm going to try those three. Whichever one I like best, I'm going to get. Um, rather than have to try things or rank things that I have remotely no interest in whatsoever. Um, and that's a contrast, of course, to the, um, the party system, the plurality system, which in my mind, the reason I call our system free market elections is the other system it operates like Soviet Russia. You go to the car lot and there's a beige sedan, there's a gray sedan. Those are your choices. You don't like it, you want a pickup truck, tough luck. Um, and so that's really the reasoning behind it is simulating the way the human mind actually sorts things. I support all arguments based on pickup trucks, thank you. Um, I would now like to go to Jennifer Roberts. Go ahead and ask your question to me. Sure, thanks for... Um... Thanks for choosing me. Um, I have a question, or actually, yeah, a question for Mr. Ketchum, um, but Mr. Kendall may also be able to answer. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really like your argument that RCV is using up political capital that we probably 
should use on something else. It's going to be more effective. And so the open primary, I love the idea. But my question is, wouldn't that also get big resistance from both political parties? Um, I actually can answer that because we did both. Um, so we did both at once, plus we prohibited dark money. So our enemies proliferated, as you might imagine. Um, we actually, um, to show how independent-minded Alaska voters are, we were formally opposed by Republican Governor Mike Dunleavy. We were formally opposed by his uh, recent opponent for governor, former U.S. Senator Democrat Mark Baggage. They both opposed us. We were opposed by Alaska Right to Life. We were opposed by Planned Parenthood. Um, so really, you, yeah, you will get opposition. And the question is, can people decide a better way? Um, here they did. Um, we did have the support of the League of Women Voters. Um, we had huge support um, from labor. Um, but the most significant thing, the reason we won the race, um, Alaska Natives make up about 25% of our electorate in Alaska. We're the most diverse state in the nation, which most people don't realize. Um, the Alaska Native vote for us, as you went through Alaska Native regions of the state, um, we were down 12 points on election night. And as the ballots came in from rural Alaska, predominantly Alaska Native regions, we won those areas two to one. They wanted uh, something different than party control. Um, and I was very proud of that. And regardless of the fact that she wasn't my first choice, I was also very proud of the fact that then you, the very first time we used the system, we elected an Alaska Native, an Alaska Native woman, in fact, for the very first time in the history of the country. And that's Congressman Mary Peltola. All right, it's wonderful. Excellent questions and excellent answers. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. That speaker's thanked. So we will now go to our next speech in the negative uh, from Mr. Barry Fagan. Go ahead, you have seven and a half minutes. Um, I'm actually in the affirmative. Oh, forgive me. Uh, I That is my mistake. Dr. Aldrich, <laughs> so sorry. Um, uh, you have seven and a half minutes, Barry. You will have five minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for doing this. I appreciate you have a nice audience. I'm one. It's a wonderful thing to be involved in something like this. Um, let me start with a, a couple of... I, I'm a professor. You're going to get that. Um, uh, context settings. One of them is that um, I prefer ranked choice voting to plurality uh, voting myself. Um, and I'm going to have a set of reactions in the negative that are fairly similar to uh, to uh, John Ketchum's. Um, second thing, um, when when um, when the nation was young, the first 50 years, um, um, as late as 1840, uh, over a quarter of the members of Congress were chosen in a in a non plurality winner take all single member district way. Um, so we have a long tradition, not a, a longer tradition, of course, a more continuous tradition of of single member districts and plurality voting, but we have an original position that also includes other voting systems. Why did, why did in 1841 or 42 in that Congress, did the Congress choose to enact a law that uh, mandated in ordinary circumstances, single member districts plurality rule? It was the first time we had two political parties that tried to appeal to uh, large electorates. So it's the first time we had an election involving what we have today, a Democratic Republican Party. And at that time, it was uh, it was the uh, Democrats and the Whigs. Um, but they recognized that the political parties gain by having single member districts and plurality ruled just as uh, just as uh, has been talked about here. Um, but that's also going to be relevant for understanding potential and I'm afraid uh, all too likely consequences at some time for, for ranked choice voting. Um, the biggest positive, the way I put the biggest positive for ranked choice voting is it allows the public 
the, the voter to express more of what they care about in politics. You have more information coming from it than you do from a, a, a dichotomous choice. That's all to the good. As has been pointed out, um, you can be overwhelmed uh, by choices. I once gave a, had the good fortune to give a talk in Australia. And the first question I had was from a political science professor who said, I just came from having to vote for 129 candidates and my ballot would be considered spoiled if I didn't rank all 129 of them. So you can get carried away, but that's that's that requires, you know, judgments, uh, much like the the way the the pro speakers have talked about uh, this, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, what I'm more concerned about is that uh, first, ranked choice voting is not as easy to manipulate strategically as plurality, as uh, people have talked about using the example of Florida and uh, Nader and, and Gore and Bush. I will remind people what Nader's comment was uh, in response to Al Gore worrying about this and saying a vote for Nader is a vote for Bush. Nader's response was a vote for either one of them is a vote for either one of them. Um, uh, so, uh, think what happened um, in the Republican Party in the last few years um, as uh, MAGA forces have tried to uh, exert control over the party. You may remember a senator named Jeff Flake from Arizona, who's a very conservative center, senator, who, um, who, but who... Uh, opposed in principle some of the uh, things that were going on in 2016, 2017, 2018. The Republican Party generally, the president, but the Republican Party, uh, uh, MAGA Republicans, went after Flake. Now, you might say that was, um, the reason that's important is because that is the consequence of ranked choice voting and trying to manipulate it to your to your uh, advantage. Suppose that uh, that there are three candidates, there's a Democrat, there's a, a MAGA Republican, there's a Jeff Flake Republican. If the way you manipulate the system is you get people to who would like Jeff Flake better than the Democrat to push the push Flake down towards the bottom of the list easier to do and there are a lot of candidates but uh push them down so um voters do not like doing this unless there is a concerted campaign on the part of oh i don't know political parties uh interest groups political action committees and the like uh which we could very well expect to happen from uh from these uh one more thing that i want to say i have the time is running short but i want to say that i agree exactly with John Ketchum, that the really big problem is that this is a small improvement. We have uh, rare opportunities to reform our system. Um, we need to make, uh, we can't waste them on small reforms. We need to, to really seriously think through the reforms we need to have an entirely more perfect union than we have now. Thank you. As hands for our excellent negative speaker, thank you. And I am now interested in questions. Um, let's start with Andy. Andrea Van Sickle, go ahead and unmute. Yep. Hey, uh, this question was actually for Ketum, um, but I I do believe this question would also pertain. Um, I would love to hear. Um, so I I. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I would like to ask the previous speaker. I live in a state where candidates are not required to win by a majority, meaning that the more candidates on a primary ballot can result and often does where someone will win, for example, 32% when the majority that came out to vote didn't vote for that person. Uh, and now that they, they're their representative, um, are you in favor or against? candidates winning by the majority vote? And two, are you in favor or against runoff elections? 
So I'm just going to have you rephrase that. Is he in favor of or opposed? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Right, so, um, so first, uh, a, a ranked choice voting is a, is a is also called quite often an instant runoff. Um, so, um, so it, you know, so in some ways, that's saying that if you like ranked choice voting, you like instant runoff. The second thing is, um, I think it's really important to have uh, the legitimacy of a candidate having the broadest possible support uh, in in the public, and uh, and and it's hidden in a in a binary choice. It's hidden uh, when you have one vote and you have you know, Jimmy Carter won the new uh, it was a Jimmy Carter running the New Hampshire primary. Somebody won the New Hampshire primary in in 1976 with like 27 percent of the vote. Um, and and that that I think yeah, it's Carter and that re resurrect. I think that's right, but I, I may be wrong on it, what it was. But it's a very low percentage. Um, that makes it hard for the rest of the public to say, yeah, I'm really behind this. That doesn't mean that ranked choice voting is the only way to figure out what a majority would want, um, and it, not necessarily the best possible way. Great. All right. And so we'll go to another question from Mr. Scott Ross. Uh, Mr. Ross, I just asked you to unmute. You can go ahead and ask your question to me. My question was also for a previous speaker, so I'll pass. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there, uh, I, I just would mention that uh, I appreciate everybody's patience as we go through and filter the questions. We're getting a lot in, and so that's the reason there's a little bit of lag. Um, but uh, it's a sign of everyone's engagement that there are so many questions coming in. Um, let's, in that case, call that good unless a panelist has a question. Perhaps you all just agree with Aldrich also. Okay, great. Um, with that, the speaker is thanked. A round of jazz hands for Professor Aldrich. Great. All right. Um, so we will now go to you, Barry, um, for your five minutes, and you will wrap up this first section of the debate for us. Take us home. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Braver Angels, for the opportunity uh, to engage this topic in a civilized and hopefully unifying manner. Um, so I'm going to first uh, talk about the past, um, and then I'm going to talk about the perfect uh, uh, as the enemy of the good, and then I'll say some things just personally about my uh, personal dissatisfaction with the, the two-party system, something that I think is shared by uh, a lot of folks, not just in attendance, but a lot of folks in America. Um, first of all, um, I think a lot of people think the two-party system is sacrosanct and all-American, and actually um, our founders had some very clear warnings against it. For example, George Washington said in his farewell address, which is like one of the best speeches ever, uh, we must be wary of the alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities. Uh, unquote. Or this from uh, his successor to the presidency. There's nothing I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. This is in my humble apprehension to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. Uh, and then finally, James Madison is personally my, my favorite of all the founders. Uh, should a state of parties arise founded on geographical boundaries and other physical and permanent distinctions which happen to coincide with them, what is to control these great repulsive masses from awful shocks against each other? I, I think that could be written yesterday. And the awful shocks against each other would be, for example, uh, the January 6th Capitol occupation and then uh, the uh, present impeachment of the, uh, of the uh, current president. Um, this, this absolutely could have been written today about in terms of physical bound, geographical boundaries, urban Democrats versus rural Republicans. So I think these writings are, are, are very prophetic. Um, and then um, let me just say as well, because I think we're running into this a lot with the previous speakers, 
the perfect is the enemy of the good, particularly in um, politics. And I would rephrase this slightly saying perfection uh, is, is the enemy of better. Um, it's actually a known theorem using reasonable definitions of what voting is and what an ideal outcome would be that um, there is no perfect uh, electoral system. That was something shown by the economist, economist Kenneth Arrow uh, uh, many years ago. Um, so given that, absolutely, I agree, ranked choice voting is not a panacea. It is not perfect, but it doesn't have to be to be way, way better than the alternatives, um, the, than the present status quo. Um, as Lee Drutman wrote in his book, which I think influenced a lot of the, those of us who learned about ranked choice vote, voting and are working for it, um, America is bitterly and horribly divided. We have uh, horribly divisive, vicious politics. We don't have a, polit a realistic political center. Um, we don't have uh, parties that truly reflect what the electorate wants. We have basically no meaningful political competition. Um, these are very, very serious problems. Um, I reject the idea that reform is zero sum that my uh, colleagues in the negative uh, have, uh, have articulated. And we can talk about that. I look forward to engaging them with them uh, on that particular question. Let me finally say that as a libertarian voter, that is one who is considered liberal on social issues and conservative, on economic ones, the two-party system does a really terrible job of representing me. Um, in order for me, I, um, so Murkowski would be, is an example of a Republican that, that I like. I think I'd be very comfortable voting for her. But in general, for me to associate uh, with the Republicans, including the MAGA types and the, uh, the social conservatives, a lot of these people just are not very nice, and I don't want to hang out with them. Um, on the other hand, the Democrats seem to me to be obsessed with, gro with growing government and putting people into specific boxes and redistributing wealth. I don't think that's the path to human flourishing. I strongly believe that having lower taxes and lower spending uh, and the rule of law, the constitutional rule of law, is the path to human flourishing for everyone. And that's what I support. So the two-party system um, really does not represent me particularly well, and ranked choice voting gives me a voice in a way that the present system um, does not. And let me just point out that there's a red, we have a red screener and a blue screener. That's nice. Where's the purple screener? I, where's the screener for people like me? So I'll just, uh, I will put that out there. So again, uh, uh, thank the speaker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, the opportunity. And I look forward to engaging both with the audience and with my co-panelists. Thank you, Jazz Hands. Um, if you're volunteering for the purple screener also, great. Um, I'm joking. I just, anytime somebody suggests that thing, I'm like, great, you'll do it. Um, it's my job. Uh, so, questions for the speaker. Uh, let's start with um, Mary Dobbins. I just have to bring you into the room and go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, Madam Chair, what I would like to understand is what qualification criteria uh, puts candidates on a list for people to vote for? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, that's going to depend a lot on how the system is actually implemented. And I'm hoping my colleagues with more um, hands-on experience in these matters um, uh, can answer that question. But um, that said, that's independent of ranked choice voting. Um, I'm sympathetic to the concerns about having to uh, identify or rank, you know, 150 candidates, um, which means that for any system that does rank choice voting, being able to not, it's vital that you not require um, can, uh, voters to rank everybody on the ballot, despite the risk of, uh, of ballot spoilage. I think that's really, really important. I can handle a list of 150 pickup trucks if, as long as I know that I don't have to try them all. I just have to try the three that I like, and you know that's it. It's no big deal. Um, now, 
that said, um, to the uh, question again, um, that's um, the best answer I can give is simply that that's going to depend on the system, but it's independent uh, of ranked choice voting. Um, I suppose one possibility would be using uh, uh, using party lists, as uh, one of my colleagues have, uh, have mentioned. That's one way of resolving that problem. That may be an inadequate answer. If so, I apologize, but it's the best answer that I have handed. Right, you get extra points for the pickup truck reference. Thank you. I'm trying. Uh, yeah, I heard it. Uh, okay, we have a couple sort of more clarity oriented questions. So we're gonna do a few more here, but I think they're quick. Um, so first, uh, Alan Falk, if you would go ahead and ask your question, that would be great. Uh, which question was that? Oh, the first one? Yes. Uh, I wanted to know whether or not uh, any of the panelists uh, would have an answer to the question, if I go to vote and it's an RCP, um, RCP type of voting, is it possible or appropriate or anything to vote for just one candidate? Yes, that gets to, uh, I assume, can I answer that question? Or Certainly. Is, okay. So I, and that's why not ranking, making uh, making sure that voters are not required to rank any more than they want in my opinion, that's vital. Some ranked choice um, voting elections have actually required voters to rank all the candidates. And even if there's a small number, like just five, even so, that may be too much for some. And one preference that voters ought to be allowed to say is, I don't care. That's really important. Being, voters should be allowed to say, this doesn't matter to me. After that, it's down in the noise. That's an important subjective preference that ought to be allowed, it seems to me. So in a ranked choice, in an RCV election, an RCV ballot, as long as it specifically says rank as many uh, uh, as you want and only that many, then yes, absolutely. You vote for the one you like and the rest, uh, your vote is, I don't care, I'm equally happy or equally miserable uh, with all of them. Excellent, okay, great. Um, David uh, Barak, go ahead and... Yes, here. thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to know from uh, Mr. Fagan or Mr. Kendall or Lockwood um, if they feel that ranked choice voting is equally desirable or beneficial in general elections and, and or primary elections, and why or why not. And just to remind the the body, the questions right now are only for Mr. Fagan. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's my belief that they are equally valid, maybe even more so. Uh, for general elections. Again, given, um, I think the use of party lists uh, is also important so that voters can identify who's affiliated with various parties, uh, even more so, and I know I keep emphasizing this, I sound like a broken record, but I'm really convinced of it, that there is not a requirement uh, to rank all the candidates. Um, one of the things, uh, I, so yes, I think they're, um, uh, I think it's equally important, or actually more so um, in, uh, in general elections. Um, it's, it's more likely to be tried at the local level and in nonpartisan elections or unipartisan election, elections. But that's just a phenomenon of people's reluctance to experiment too much uh, at this point, preferring the devil you know. Um, but yes, I hope that it will eventually be used in, wide, uh, uh, in widespread use in general elections. All right. And um, this is our, our last sort of good question opportunity. So I'm just going to, we're going to throw in a couple more because I think they're good. Um, so Al Smith, go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. I'm hitting ask to unmute for you. Um, okay, you work on that. Let's go to Vahe. Vahe? Um, uh, I think you're already unmuted, so. I am, and, and very good job pronouncing my name too. Uh, so um, my question is, uh, is ranked choice voting more or less corruptible by political dark money than plurality voting? You know, if I were an oligarch with a few hundred million in Bitcoin and felt very strongly about an election, which system would I prefer be in place? Funny you should ask is I wrote a paper that addresses exactly that question and it, it'll be in the references at the end. I apologize for posting a reference uh, out of order. So first of all, let me just be clear. Um, when you talk about corruptibility, the system, the, um, 
the vocabulary, the term that political science scientists use is uh, strategic voting or tactical voting. That is voting to achieve uh, voting in some way different from your preferences in uh, your personal preferences in order to achieve some larger uh, um, uh, some larger result. So all systems, I regret to say, uh, are vulnerable to tactical voting, are vulnerable to um, corruption in, in that sense. There, there is no perfect voting system, and we've known that for a while. That said, I believe, and I spelled out in my paper why, that um, RCV for a variety of reasons is to be preferred. Uh, so even if you're on, there's lots of criteria to consider with voting systems, but if you just consider tactical voting, I believe that RCV is better than plurality voting, than approval voting, than star voting, than, than all the other systems that are out there. But it's not an ironclad case. You can make a, a, a good debate and a good case for various subtle reasons that other systems might be preferable. But I spell it out in my paper, um, which I uh, won't read here because it's rather long, but I'll provide it in the references at the end. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, Al Smith, one more chance. I think I'll go ahead and just read your question because uh, it looks like the unmuting isn't working. Uh, this has sort of come up a couple of times, but just because I think it's a tough one, I want to bring it back. So Al wanted to ask, so both political parties probably don't favor RCV. With this situation, how do we convince them to do it? Oh, it's really tough. Really, really tough. But you know, no, uh, um, nothing is easy. Political reform uh, is, is not easy. In my opinion, and um, I'm sure my colleagues will weigh in on this as well, but um, in, in my opinion, both parties, even though they resisted, um, still claim to have some sort of principles, some that they at least pay lip, lip service to. And RCV, in my opinion, is consistent with an appeal to both uh, the principles of, of both parties. Now, I wrote a paper about the conservative case for uh, RCV, in which I argued why um, uh, RCV is consistent with and supportive of conservative principles. I haven't done it. Uh, for the liberal, for the left yet in terms of social justice and equal access and personal choice and political competition. Um, but I believe all those things uh, are relevant and um, can be used to appeal to at least the principled members of the parties. But yes, politicians of both parties are absolutely committed to doing whatever it takes to stay in power. And uh, what can you do? People of goodwill just need to stand up and say, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to stand for that anymore. This is these are this is important to me, and that's what I think Braver Angels uh, is all about. And Madam Chair, if I might, um, I think it's I'm delighted to answer questions, but the fact that sole fact that I went last um, seems to me to be grossly unfair to my colleagues, both uh, the affirmative and the negative. And I hope there'll be an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions to individual panelists directly. Yes, I was just going to thank you for um, letting us interrogate you longer. And it, it just has ended up that way, that that's when our, all of our questions came in. Um, for the moment, uh, I let's just uh, acknowledge that those were excellent questions and very good answers. So jazz hands one more time, and we'll thank the speaker. And I'm going to transition us to the next section of the debate. Um, the uh, So we're now there. Uh, um, there the, the next sort of part of this is that every speaker is going to have a chance to uh, give response remarks. So we go in reverse order. Um, so Barry, you're going to talk a little bit more. Um, you can be too. Um, uh, but we go in reverse order, and uh, everybody has. Well, in this case, because we have fewer negatives than affirmatives, the affirmatives will each have two minutes. And the negatives will each have three minutes. In order to guide that, and these response speeches, as you know, panelists are, um, you don't have to think of it as a rebuttal so much as just like actually a response, like hearing all this, what do you wanna say? Um, and as guidance for that, um, we actually do a poll. And so Leslie, if you would go ahead and launch the poll, um, participants, excuse me, uh, audience members, please tell us what you're interested in hearing more about. Um, that'll help guide our panelists on sort of what direction to send their next remarks. We have one minute to plan out.
All right, about 10 seconds. All right, very good. Um, I would like to point out that uh, someone has just chatted to me, this should be ranked choice voting. <laughs> so, sorry about that, folks. Um, but uh, let's see what we got. <laughs> yes, exactly, jazz hands for real. It looks like people are particularly interested in um, the impact ranked choice voting uh, will have on campaigning, how ranked choice voting impacts the party system, and the effect of ranked choice voting on polarization. Um, sort of next up are how shifts to ranked choice voting have or would impact voters, the impact on election security, and the constitutionality. But particularly of interest are uh, the impact on campaigning on the party system and polarization. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to, like I said, we go in reverse order. And so uh, Barry, you have, oh, also panelists, you have to actually click the little X to get that window to go away. Um, uh, but Barry, I'm gonna come back to you for two minutes and yeah, say whatever. Yeah, okay, to. so um, it's my belief that ranked choice viewing improves the quality of political campaigning for reasons that have already been cited. And I think I also, uh, broke the rules and posted uh, at least an anecdote about that happening where candidates have actually encouraged uh, people if they if, if you're not going to vote for me vote for my, uh, uh, this person here because they're also nice and we agree on a lot of things kind of imagine that kind of uh, civility in modern political discourse today um, let me also point out the civility of the nature of this discussion and I don't think it's just because it's better angels I think it's inherent in RCV People, because it's so pluralistic, people just are used to talking about multiple opinions and allowing multiple opinions and having diversity, have, have forbid, uh, of thought. Um, let me also point out that both of my uh, colleagues who are arguing in the negative, neither of them are against RCV. They would argue that reform is zero sum and we need to, RCV isn't bad, but these things are better and we only have so much political energy or reform money. For, or resources, so we should focus elsewhere. And okay, we can talk about that, but those are not negatives against RCV. No one here has said anything bad, as far as I can tell, about RCV um, in principle. Um, let me also, um, um, no, it's all right, I'll leave it at that. I have a couple of questions uh, for uh, for my colleagues on the panel at the appropriate time, but um, I will leave, since I've only got two minutes, I'll just uh, leave it at that. All right, excellent. Uh... So for our next response speech, we'll go to Professor Aldrich for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to say two things in this period. One of them is that uh, somebody raised an incredibly good and important question about how do we know this is a viable candidate? Who, who get, How do we choose who gets to be in set, uh, involved in the ranked choice voting? Um, the, theory had always been for political parties that the political parties uh, choose a set of candidates from which then we we could choose. Um, uh, it's an incomplete part of ranked choice voting that it's, uh, it's not yet a, a fully integrated into the system of campaigning and elections. That's the one thing I want to say. Second thing is uh, then uh, it, it's, it's not my position that reform is zero sum. My position is we get about one chance. We need to do everything at once that we can try to get to make a, a whole complete and coherent system of, uh, of reforms of the political system to achieve, as I've said before, the, the, uh, this, this round of uh, being a more perfect union. Um, and it may be that ranked choice voting be a part of it. It may be that we would want some other system because it depends so much on what all other aspects of reform uh, go together to make up a co coherent and useful system. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I would point out many of the, the pieces of evidence are based on a uh, relatively uh, small number of times that people have uh, uh, used ranked choice voting in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in elections. Uh, and we don't quite know really how it's going to evolve over a longer period of time, particularly if it we're at a national level choosing a whole Congress, Senate, presidency as, as it is. Thank you. All right, very good. 
jazz hands. Thank you so much. And next we will go to Mr. Kendall. You have two minutes, go for it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so I wanted to sort of boil it down. Um, ranked choice voting asks you a relatively simple question for all we talk about this. Um, the only question it asks you is, your candidate can't win. Do you have any opinion about the remaining candidates? That's it. And sometimes the answer to that is no, and voters aren't required to rank anyone else. Um, I will point out that at least under Alaska system for candidates, the vast majority of people, their second choice never matters because by definition, majority of the votes will go to the top two. And if you ranked one of the top two candidates, your vote never transfers. Um, and I have had some success. Um, some people, if you reframe it and you say, well, how about ranked aversion voting? Are there people you hate the most? Rank them last and work your way up. And actually that framing has worked. Um, when people are confronted with that, they find, especially an Alaska system that allows multiple Democrats, multiple Republicans, um, as we saw in our US House race, Republicans can be very, very different from one another um, in temperament and policies and so forth. And you saw um, this behavior in particular um, where a number of people ranked Mary Peltola after the Democrat after ranking the Republican first. You know, maybe that's an artifact of Alaska being 60% independent. I don't know. Um, but I do think the entire world acts as though politics is two dimensional, left to right. It's three dimensional. Maybe it's four dimensional. There's charisma, there's funding, there's professionalism, there's attitude, there's empathy. It's not as simple as a bundle of, you know, checking the box on five conservative policies. There's so much more to it than that. Um, I wanted to give just a couple quick examples from Alaska because I think they're instructive. Um, uh, under the old system in, in 2020, uh, a state senator named John Coghill lost his election. John Coghill is sort of a legend in Alaska. His father, Jack Coghill, was one of the original signers of Alaska's constitution. And what happened was um, he lost because only 9% of his electorate voted in his primary and 5% of his electorate chose to vote for another person. So 5% chose for everyone else. There was no competitive general election. 5% of his, of his district decided who their state senator was going to be. Um, another example is um, State Senator Kathy Giesel. She was a very, very conservative governor or very, very conservative state senator, like the most conservative, you know, pro-life, soup to nuts. Um, our governor proposed cutting funding for our university system in half. She thought that was a bad idea. He, he came out against her, endorsed against her. She lost her primary. She immediately ran again under the new system and she won. She's now the Senate majority leader. And the story she told me, which I found incredible, was um, she loved running the second time or this, this time out of the new system. She said, I threw out my walk sheet. I knocked on every door because I wanted their vote. I wanted their second vote. I wanted to hear their concerns. She said it actually went faster and was more pleasant. Isn't that what we want? Um, another example, Mary Poltola, Lisa Murkowski, statewide Republican, statewide Democrat, endorsed each other. Where on earth does that happen? And isn't that what we'd want to happen when two people like each other and actually are voting for one another? Um, and then the final example is we actually had two um, campaigns for governor and they actually paid jointly to put up a joint ad. And they actually said, vote for me, but if you don't rank him second and vice versa, um, that is, that's the change we need. Um, Endorsements across parties, endorsements across campaigns, common ground, civility at the end of the day. All right, hard to argue with that, at least for me. Um, very good. So our next response speech will come from Mr. John Ketchum. Go ahead and then you have two minutes, excuse me, three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree that the perfect is too often the enemy of the good in this uh, context. But that's why I'm arguing that RCV shouldn't necessarily be used everywhere, I'm reinforcing Dr. Aldrich's point. Uh, but we should, in the spirit of federalism, allow the people of each state and locality to decide for themselves what is better than plurality, but not perfect per se, and that might not be RCV. I also agree that the two-party system hasn't served ev everyone well, uh, but we do need parties. 
Um, this can be seen at the local level, uh, which implicates issues of incredible importance to people's everyday lives, things like schools, police, and transportation. Now, many of these issues at the local level are political in the sense that there are differences in opinion on how to achieve a particular end, but they are not partisan. So I'll give an example, parks management. You can have a track for runners or you can have more green space. Um, there is no real way to, to say that that's a conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat debate, but it is a political one. There are going to be vigorous discussions and contestations about that issue. Um, so parties can help coordinate uh, voters and people who care about one issue over another. Uh, they can also help coordinate legislative activities. But it makes really no sense to decide these local matters based on whether you like Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Um, now, parties don't like RCV because it often takes more control away from them. And I say, let's, uh, especially at the local level, um, let's give them more control, but let's have more parties and let's have them compete against one another. And that's what party list systems accomplish. Um, I'd also like to elaborate briefly on the issue of voter information. And this is actually an argument against RCV. It affects every electoral system, but it's particularly acute for RCV um, because Although we all wish that everyone who goes to votes learns about the candidates and their policy platforms, research and experience have shown that voters rely very heavily on information cues on ballots, like party labels, to make their decisions. Um, when there are no such cues on the ballot, they often wind up voting for whoever is most familiar to them, name recognition, um, or whoever is first on the ballot alphabetically, or even worse, based on their perceptions of the candidate's race or gender as signaled by that candidate's name. Now, why is this a problem for RCV? It's because voters are asked to know enough about multiple candidates to put them in a particular order of preference. Um, so it's just a higher information burden on the voters. Uh, one reason for ballot exhaustion is simply because voters don't know enough about all the candidates that are running. Uh, as we mentioned, sometimes there are hundreds. Uh, so they don't select all their possible rankings. Um, and many times that means that the ballot is tossed. Now, low uh, it's, it's tossed before the final round, uh, round of voting, the one that actually matters. Um, now, low information voting uh, can also affect state and local elections in particular because the candidates can be poorly known outside of their immediate neighborhoods or where media is very expensive to purchase, as in New York City, um, or where there's little local journalism. We, we have to re re uh, reckon with the fact that uh, local papers have declined precipitously in the United States. Now, there are a few ways to overcome these informational challenge, uh, such as by providing voters with a comprehensive information guide or through the innovations like uh, on ballot endorsements that I mentioned earlier. But it does stand to reason, Madam Chair, that those who are in favor of RCV should be the most enthusiastic about overcoming these types of challenges so that the winners can claim a mandate of an informed and deliberative electorate. Very good. All right, jazz hands. Mr. Ketchum, thank you so much. And our last but not least, our final response speech will be uh, Nathan Lockwood. Go ahead, you have two minutes. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, so I just, uh, in response to the previous speaker who, uh, who you know, I, I really, first of all, I just want to say I really admire all my fellow panelists here today, really impressive group. Um, so about, about the uh, low information voter problem, too many choices, let's just say there are, you know, I agree with, um, John about, you know, we have this federal approach. We States can be laboratories for democracy. Different cities can be laboratories for democracy. They should find things that work well for them. Uh, I think I think everybody on this panel pretty much is a uh, fan of proportional representation. That's all good. As far as the low information voting problem, if that, if a jurisdiction wants to really solve for that, Alaska's shown us how to do it, as Scott has said. Basically, you have a preliminary election that advances four candidates. And, you know, if voters can't learn about four candidates or, you know, three of the four candidates, it's, it's on them at that at that point. And I think we all completely agree with John about uh, all the other you know, improvements, including getting better information to voters. You can do RCV in a strong party way. You can do it in a weak party way. Um, and that top four system is also shown, as Scott described in great detail, how to solve the ballot exhaustion problem. And I would also add that that um, that top four preliminary that Scott described or top four primary 
um, it's pretty impressive how even just picking one out of 48 candidates, you consistently saw 65 to 70 percent of voters in those primaries advance seeing one of their choice seeing their choice advance to the general election. That's one of the advantages of advancing four. That's far superior to what typically happens in our uh, partisan primary system right now, where you know someone might win the Democratic primary with 23 percent, the Republican primary with 30 percent. You know, what percentage of voters were happy out of that? You know, less than 30 percent. Anyways, we agree on a lot. I, I encourage you, everybody to read John Ketchum's paper, which I did in preparation for this debate, which is a great just he does a great job covering all the many reforms that could happen in New York. Just to highlight the value of combining in, uh, reforms, New York's an example of this. They com they passed several reforms in the last decade, including um, term limits, including public financing and including ranked choice voting. And when these uh, three reforms converged in the last election, it resulted in a really uh, transformational change in the city council, which was that uh, women's representation in that city council. Well, also I would add, there was another change, which was there were women's organizations that were providing support and training to uh, help prepare more female, uh, women candidates. Women went from 27% to 61% on the New York City City Council. It's the first time they ever held a majority of the seats. And believe me, uh, women in New York City are are pretty excited about that. Um, so that, I think it highlights uh, something John is talking about, which is the power of combining reforms. I think it also highlights something that Barry said, which I could, complete, couldn't agree with more, which is about not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And that's really why Rank the Vote uh, is, is focused currently. We work on other things, but we're focused on ranked choice voting because we think it is really at that sweet spot of achievable reform and impactful reform. So ranked choice voting is win winnable. If you, folk, you know, it's now used in 50 cities, two states statewide. Um, and say what you want about the two parties. I mean, we all have our thoughts about them, the two major parties. But with education and public pressure, they will support it. Evidence for this. So after Maine won ranked choice voting by ballot measure, not the two parties were not supporting it. It just they got it passed over their objections. Afterwards, they saw people like it. The legislature in Maine. Passed, passed legislation to extend it to use it in their presidential elections. Um, you know, Utah, Republican state, passed RCV legislation on a bipartisan basis, signed by the governor to use ranked choice voting in local elections. In Virginia, when the Dems came to power, they passed RCV enabling local legislation. And Virginia Republicans discovered that if they wanted to nominate electable candidates, ranked choice voting was a great way to do that by using it in their primaries. The Oregon legislature uh, just made a historic milestone of being the first legislature to advance statewide uh, RCV legislation to use it in all, you know, congressional, Senate, and then all their executive offices for state state office. They're advancing that to the ref for referendum for their voters. They're saying we think voters should be able to vote to decide if they want to do this, which is the, a first. Um, in Rhode Island, we just uh, ranked the vote, helped. Uh, Last example, yeah. Okay, hundred percent. In Rhode Island, uh, we launched. Uh, we 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 supported a grassroots activist there, volunteers there to launch uh, Ocean State RCV. Uh, they happened. Their launch happened to coincide with a special election for Congress, with uh, 10, uh, 10 folks running to fill a congressional seat in the Democratic primary in Rhode Island. That Democratic primary is going to decide that election. Um, nine out of the ten candidates endorsed ranked choice voting. Six of them showed up at the launch meeting for Ocean State RCV um, to talk about their support for ranked choice voting. So it is a cultural change. They're responding to voters' reaction because voters are liking it. When voters learn about it, 60% support it. And when the politicians see that the voters like it, they eventually get on board. So thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. All righty. Jazz hands for Mr. Lockwood. Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, uh, in response to popular demand, and because we do have a little bit of time, um, we're going to actually take three more questions that any panelists that are will just be uh, thrown out to the panel. Um, and so for the first one, uh, Eric Bidstrup, I have just brought you in. Go ahead and ask your question to me. Great. Thank you. First of all, thanks to the Braver Angels for hosting this forum. I love the civil dialogue between all of the uh, participants. It's just fantastic to hear. Uh, my question is primarily directed at the, the negative representatives, Mr. Aldrich and Mr. Ketchum, but open to all. Um, for the negative uh, speakers, 
the objections that I heard didn't seem to really be about ranked choice voting proper, but rather that it is not a singular panacea and that a broader set of reforms are needed. My question to you in the spirit of uh, a discussion on ranked choice voting, how would you rank your top couple of additional reforms beyond ranked choice voting uh, that you would love to see? Thank you for the time. All right, great. Either, either John can go first, up to you. Uh, I'll start off. So I would like to see um, a way to re resolve gerrymandering. Um, and secondly, uh, a way to uh, make um, voting as easy as possible for as many, uh, uh, many in the electorate as, as possible. Those are the two things that I would take as the very first shots out of the, out of the reform agenda. I would have to just add to that um, two of the three things that I mentioned, um, adding endorsements to ballots so that voters can know immediately how to align their values and preferences with those who are running. Uh, I think that could be a real game changer. Um, uh, again, I wish that everyone would do his or her homework, but um, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, the other is to move local elections on cycle. Most uh, Many jurisdictions, including my own here, uh, host their municipal or local elections um, on odd numbered years. And that has shown to decrease turnout significantly and increase the influence of special interests. Um, you can win a race uh, with much fewer people. So you tend to elect uh, people who will provide a favor to a special interest. Um, and then the third would be looking at assembly sizes. And assembly sizes have been shown to be very important when it comes to descriptive representation. Do the people who actually go to a legislative body look like those who are they're representing? Um, as well as substantive representation, um, you can draw districts uh, smaller. So I, I would favor a larger um, assemblies. The House of Representatives is probably the best example. We have 435 House members. That was set rather arbitrarily um, about a century ago when each member was representing about 200,000 or so voters and now, or constituents, and now it's over 700, 750,000. So if you care about constituent services, you should want um, that number to go down. Awesome. All right. Uh, yes, we will now go to a question from Dr. Fagan, and uh, if we could just try to keep answers brief so as many as pe people as possible can get in, that would be awesome. Go yes, um, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. I have a question for those who are in favor of open primaries, which I am, but it's very controversial. And again, in the spirit of understanding perfect is the enemy of the better, but I'm wondering for open primaries, on the, the idea seems to me that, so anybody can come in and vote for the candidate that's most representative of their views. But isn't it also, wouldn't it also be possible that there's a tactical voting risk and that people could come in and uh, vote for the most odious candidate they could think of in the hopes that they will win so that um, then that candidate will, it will inevitably lose to the candidate of the other party, which is what, uh, what they really want to see. If, if I'm making any sense. Is that also a risk and no, does it matter? Anybody who wants to can jump in on that one. You may have stumped them, Dr. Fagan. I guess so. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. You just okay. take that as a, uh, as a bat, as a, some badness and you just have to live with it. Okay. So let me try this. In, uh, uh, in the early 1970s, the Wisconsin Republican Party tried to get um, uh, Republicans to vote in the Democratic primary for George Wallace. Mm -hmm. um, precisely what you're talking about. The surveys indicated that that people are more than willing to to consider all kinds of alternatives, but that was not one of them that they were willing to consider crossing over to the other party to intentionally screw up their their own selection interesting all right for the sake of time we're going to move on but yeah food for thought um, yeah real, real quick madam sure. chair just yeah I'm, in these systems where you're advancing uh four or five candidates from the preliminary or primary to the general 
um, you, you know, the math of it, which we won't get too much into, is that the fourth or fifth candidate can can get on, get advanced. It, it, give you an example: Mary Peltola, first special congressional election in Alaska with the top four system. Uh, Scott can correct me if I'm wrong. I think she got like eight percent in that initial primary, and went on to win it in the general. But my point is, um, if you're in this situation, you know, getting people to vote for the you know opposite side, some weak candidate on the opposite side, it, it it's not going to be possible for them to knock out a strong opponent when that strong opponent could get on with 8% of the vote. And with a top five system, that's going to go down even lower. So that's just thought there. Thank you. Susie Ammons, go ahead and unmute. Ask your question to me. Hey, you are unmuted. Great. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all. This has been really so educational for me. My question is, um, I'm in California. How would... Uh, I'm How would sorry. one get these steps? That what would be the first steps to get RCB in one state? What? How? How would one go about doing that? Yeah. So first of all, um, my apologies, given that that when you said you uh, lived in California, of course yeah. it's a wonderful state, but it's also a one-party state. And in fact, it's my understanding, and I'll leave it to my more experienced colleagues to weigh in in more detail. But it's my understanding that. Uh, California supposedly at least once considered and rejected it. But again, there's no surprise. It's a one party state. Why would one party uh, agree to anything that is uh, potentially a risk to their uh, to their power? And we've talked uh, as, as has been mentioned before. So um, awfully sorry about that. Uh, good luck. And I'll ask, defer to my colleagues to offer more detailed strategies. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I would follow up on that and say, you know, the, the crown prince of the Democratic Party in, in California, Governor Newsom, is staunchly against ranked choice voting and actually sent some quotes up our way to try to get Democrats to vote against us. Uh, I mean, the answer to me is take it to the streets. You know, in Western states like California, like Alaska, you can do a ballot measure. Go do it. Build a movement and, you know, see what happens. It's been a... Systems like Alaska's have been on the ballot twice here and in Nevada, and it's passed both times. So give people a choice. Because the people who have, I mean, the people in power, they have gotten in power by playing by the rules of the old game. Not a lot of people get to the Super Bowl and then want to agree to change the rules because they're winning under the old rules. Yeah, and I'd, I'd be remiss. One of our state partners, Cal RCV, is there. So I would go right to their website. Uh, and sign up and, and get involved as a volunteer or member and have that uh, and, and find out, you know, what their strategy is right now and share your thoughts and get involved with the work they're doing to bring ranked choice voting in California. They've already in California won ranked choice voting in a number of cities there, uh, quite a few, a lot in the Bay Area, um, Albany passed it recently, Eureka, a number of, there's a, there's a lot in California. They're continuing to win more cities and uh, they have a plan for how they want to proceed to to win it for other offices as well. So uh, let me just check. I think it's www.calrcv.org. C-A-L-R-C-V.org. Great, thank you. It's a very specific answer, I love it. All right, for a final question, uh, Ms. Leah Sargent, go ahead and unmute. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I think a few of the recent questions have touched on this, but you know, I feel like I've heard two contradictory things a little bit during this debate from the app side, which are that, you know, Ranked choice voting is profoundly destabilizing to political parties and kind of perverse tendencies within them. And that once it's in place, they're kind of won over and don't try and roll it back or eliminate it. So I'd like to hear speakers in the app, you know, talk a little about what they think makes RCV stable once adapt adopted um, and whether it can only be adopted in places where it genuinely isn't a threat to the party systems and the elites. Barry, Scott, or Nathan? I'm happy yeah, to talk, but I always talk first. Let someone else talk first. Scott, uh, how about you? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess I would say that a couple things about that. I mean, people have recency bias. Um, up here, our strongest opposition is Republican opposition, quite for the simple fact that Mary Peltola won, never mind the fact that she's a blue dog Democrat and probably very, very close to the political center 
interestingly, um, we had a two-term Democratic governor because the Republican Party had a civil war in the 90s. And Republicans, representatives of the Republican Party, actually put a ballot measure on the ballot to have ranked choice voting in 2002. Um, they ran a horrible campaign and they got beat two to one. Um, and it didn't deal with the primary problem, but they had John McCain uh, doing ads for them and so forth. So it's really a matter of recency bias. Right now, Democrats up here appear to love it. And I think that's due to Mary Peltola winning. Although I would point out we had three statewide races. We elected a very conservative governor. We elected a moderate Lisa Murkowski Republican and a moderate Democrat. Same electorate picked all three people. Um, so I guess I would say, to me, that looks like the system working. And elected officials, um, you know, they've tried to repeal it in Maine. The people have rejected that a couple times. I think ultimately, it, you know, the muscle memory is tough, but those people want to stay in power. And if the people show that's what they want, um, at some point they they go along for the ride, I guess would be my advice. Great. Gary? Let, let me just say that, just so we're clear, um, there are instances of cities adopting RCV uh, and then repealing it. So um, I want to you know, concede that to the, um, the negatives uh, up front. So um, it's not once you get it, then it's all peace and love and everybody sings Kumbaya. Um, that does not always happen. Um, but um, that said, uh, I'll just agree with uh, what Scott said. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, that's all I'll say. All right. Nathan? Yeah, just real quick. Yeah, so I mean, well, I agree with the previous speakers. I mean, surveys of voters, whether it's Alaska or Utah, or Minneapolis or whatnot, in general, they they overwhelmingly are satisfied with the system, happy with it, the fact they adopted it. In New York, I think the figure was like 75% uh, wanted to keep using it and over 50% wanted to use it for more elections, not just their local elections. And that's pretty typical. And the longer people use it, the more, the more they tend to like it. As Barry said, yeah, there are cases where it's you know poorly implemented or you know, uh, or uh, enacted in a way that sort of catches people by surprise and they don't understand it. And in a small handful of places, it's been rolled back. And some of those places have then voted it back in again. Um, but yeah, I think over the long term, it, 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 the, it's quite stable. I think, as, uh, as Scott said, the opposition will die down as they see people's satisfaction persist. All right. I may just add that. Um, there were uh, a few reasons why um, people oppose RCV. Um, I concede that the polls today, surveys today show that most are indeed satisfied, but um, older voters and Republicans show higher levels of dissatisfaction with RCV, perhaps um, expectedly. But the two fundamental reasons are that uh, people don't like um, unexpected results, and that can happen from come from behind victories. It doesn't happen often. It's under 5%. But um, Jared Golden in the 2018 New Hampshire race, for example, was a come from behind victor. And those kinds of unexpected outcomes um, lead some people to think that something is amiss. So the very mechanism that allows uh, ranked choice voting to be so appealing to many is also what leads to great skepticism. Um, and the second reason why people oppose it, uh, especially party officials oppose it, is um, because of this vote leakage problem. When you have a, a candidate from a major party and that person is eliminated and the votes from that individual goes to the opposite major party or a very different uh, second minor party. That uh, vote leakage problem was the primary cause of the demise of the single transferable vote uh, reforms that swept the country in the middle of the 20th century and is largely the reason why, with the exception of Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, none of them have retained it. Uh, even New York City, where you know we used to have the single transferable vote, multi-member districts, all of that. Um, but now we've replaced it with single member district RCV, single winner uh, style. Um, so if you're interested in, in the dynamics at play there, I highly recommend uh, the work of Jack Santucci, who I mentioned before, and his book, uh, More Parties or No Parties, which was released last year. All right, one more round of jazz hands for these questions and excellent answers. 
We are moving to the final section of our evening, um, which is quick. Uh, and um, it is our debrief. Um, and then we'll just have a few closing announcements and wrap up. So uh, for this section, we will invite everyone to answer these two questions. Um, what is something, or what did you learn tonight and what did you enjoy? And so panelists, you'll get to answer those. And uh, I'd like to invite attendees to put their answers in the chat. We're opening it for you now. And we also have a poll. Uh, so Leslie, go ahead and launch that. And then panelists, I'll call on you in a minute. So you have, once again, attendees, you have uh, one minute to answer this. All right, 10 seconds. All right, thanks everybody. So let's see what we got. What do people like about tonight's debate? Um, most of all, the respect shown to others, 77%. Also, people have a deeper understanding of the issues, 73%. Truthfulness and honesty of opinion shared. And uh, then pretty good votes for the energy and passion of speakers also. So high marks. Um, uh, and did this affect how you think about the issue? Yeah, it looks like over 75% of people, they either somewhat agree or strongly agree. And then has how is your thinking about the other side changed? 85% say I'm more able to see how the other side thinks. Okay, that's a successful debate. Well done, guys, um, all of all of us. Um, so we can go ahead and, and end the poll. Um, remember panelists, you'll have to actually click the X. And yeah, so, and we're getting wonderful things. <laughs> Somebody noticed that my dog photobombed. Wow. Um, we're getting wonderful things in the chat. Uh, perspective is much more informed. Um, have learned so much. Thank you. Love the positive energy and respectful environment. Uh, one person really enjoyed the detailed Alaska vignettes, um, enjoyed the uh, civil discussion, all of that. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so panelists, uh, you can raise your hands um, and throw in anything you want to about what you enjoyed and what you learned tonight. Dr. Aldrich. I would like to say that I learned a I, well, I was very appreciative of the uh, audience pr providing such really terrific questions. Um, I You're think really that's the biggest, biggest positive. Totally. Other thoughts? So I'll go. Um, I wanted to, partic in particular, cite, um, in terms of my understanding more about the issues, uh, um, John Ketchum's comment about the information problem and RCV's vulnerability to it. Um, I hadn't thought about that, but I think that's a very good point. Fortunately, I also think it's solvable. Political parties exist to provide that information for voters so that voters uh, don't have to you know, read all the Wikipedia, Wikipedia entries for everybody. And that's completely compatible with RCV, but I do think it's incumbent uh, as a result of hearing uh, John's um, views, I think it's incumbent upon those of us who advocate for RCV to specifically point out that that issue and explain how we would deal with it. So um, that I thought was uh, was really important. Um, and as for all as for all the rest of it, yeah, this is really great. This is good stuff. I just advise uh, all of you in the audience who are obviously people of goodwill. Um, uh, we've got some serious issues. America is broken, but it is absolutely fixable. Uh, and I'd like to think these debates are a small but very important part uh, of that. So I hope that each and every one of you who are in attendance have been inspired to go out, learn more, talk more, uh, do more. America is worth saving. Mm -hmm.
Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, other folks, you can throw in something or not, as you wish. If I may, I learned how many bridges we can build in this space. Um, I would be more than happy to collaborate with my fellow panelists on either side, because we're really pursuing this um, in a spirit of constructive conversation towards the common good. We all want the same thing. We want the will of the electorate to be expressed in the most honest way possible. We want more turnout. Uh, we, want, we just want a fair game. Whoever wins, wins. Um, and I'm very pleased to, to know that I have um, a fellow uh, compatriot in, in Professor Fagan, uh, an electoral reform on the right, which is, uh, as he is no doubt aware, a very <laughs> difficult path to tread uh, many times. But um, I like that this was a very spirited and substantive conversation, but it wasn't polemical. We, we did not get down to the point of, you know, um, trying to win at all costs. And sometimes that's what politics is about too, right? It's about cooperation. Um, and ideally, we should seek the good and the true in that as well, even in our political lives. And my apologies, my apologies for um, um, trying to get in one last thing. John, I appreciate that very much. Um, I wouldn't consider myself on the right as someone who is liberal on social issues and conservative on economic ones, someone who's a classical liberal, liberal or a libertarian. Yeah, the right lets me play in their sandbox more than the left does, but I'm trying desperately to fix that. So with that correction, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We, we can walk the road together nonetheless. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's been a real pleasure to uh, to be on this panel with everybody to get their different perspectives. Uh, you know, I'd read Barry's paper before. I, I never met John. I knew the Manhattan Institute had done some great things around uh, election reform, and it was great to read his paper. And uh, gosh, Scott, uh, thank you so much for, for what you've done in Alaska. And and John, great to meet you as well. I look forward to, to, to learning more about uh, your work and really enjoyed learning about your views tonight. And uh, yeah, so just but and I, I've really uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. You've done a great job, and it's been kind of fun getting to use the words Madam Chair a lot tonight. I don't, it's not not a phrase I use a lot, so it's been a real pleasure too. So thank you so much. Absolutely, yes, um, lovely. Okay, well, uh, just a few announcements, and then we'll be done. The first thing is many people, and I mean, if anybody else wanted to throw in something, you can. But um, the uh, Many people have asked us, uh, this is clearly like, people love this, guys. And the way we can tell is that lots of people are saying, is there a recording? When can I see it? Where is it? And the answer is there is a recording. It will go up on the Braver Angels YouTube channel, probably around Sunday or Monday. It depends how fast we can get that to happen. Um, but yes, this will absolutely be shareable. Uh, and that's where you'll be able to find it. Uh, additionally, as we've been saying, there are lots of valuable resources. We invited each panelist to submit some. And so... There's a document that contains um, bios, definitions, that video, somebody requested that, um, and the, you know, many of the papers that have been referred to, as well as uh, Hans's work. So if you are interested in additional information, go ahead and click that link. You'll get uh, to a sheet with several of those resources linked for you. Um, we have, uh, we always are trying to improve these, and so we would love your feedback. Um, we have a little survey for you. It's very quick. Um, but uh, that link will go in the chat. There it is. And um, we would love it if you would tell us how, what you thought of this and, and uh, that always helps us improve. There's also a section in there for other topics. And speaking of other topics, um, we have a debate coming up in a month, uh, uh, almost exactly. It's October 19th at 8 p.m. And as you can see, our topic for that one is resolved. The media has become a conspiracy of left-wing ideology. So should be nice and spicy. Um, and that one's a community debate, which means everyone can come and uh, tell us what you think about the conspiracy of left-wing ideology or that is or is not the media, depending what your position may be. Um, you can uh, register for that now. Just go ahead and click on that link. Uh, and finally, I'd like to invite um, the woman who really, really made this happen. Um, she's a volunteer, she's incredible. And uh, uh, Gretchen Schreiber to tell us a little bit about why she's part of this. So go ahead, Gretchen. Yeah, jazz hands. Oh, program. thank you all. Um, oh, hi, everybody. So uh, my job right now is to make a pitch for Braver Angels, which I'm extremely happy to do um, because Braver Angels has just been a wonderful part of my life for the last few years. Um, I tell people it kept me sane. 
I think we have an amazing country. Um, and if we can't talk to each other and keep moving things forward and talk about our issues such that we find a way to resolve them that works truly for not just this group or that group, but for the country, we're losing ground. And that would be such a shame. And in Braver Angels, I feel like in some small way, I can help work on that and learn more about how to keep moving things forward. And so I'm not only a member, I'm a volunteer. And as April said, I have had the absolute pleasure over the last few months of being the organizer for this debate. And I've just been so happy this evening uh, to see how many people attended and to watch the excellent content. Um, so I want to encourage you not just to become a member of Braver Angels, if you aren't already, but also get involved because Honest to gosh, being a volunteer has been the most rewarding experience of all. It lets me feel like I'm doing my bit to help um, and and doing what I want to do to be a good citizen for America. And that's my pitch. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Yes, absolutely. And I don't remember which of you who, who said this, but the idea that America is worth saving, it absolutely is. And um, we can't do this by ourselves. So please join us. Uh, there are a couple of links in the chat. One of them is to join Brave Angels as a member and then there's also the debate teams, uh, our our volunteer link and, and more info about us. So if you liked this, we would love to see you there. Um, we're gonna end with a song. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this has been a fabulous evening. I have learned so much, just like so many people said in the chat. And uh, so yeah, we will just um, end with some excellent music.